Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We have um, just a few announcements this morning. Sharon Hoover is providing fellowship downstairs. Um, and we welcome Larry Lang to the pulpit this morning. He's filling in for Pastor while he takes some time. Does anybody know of any other announcements? There won't be any Bible study this week. And I think that's about it. So let's go. Al, did you? I just found out that Nancy O'Connell is going to have surgery in a couple of weeks. Nancy O'Connell is going to have to have surgery in a couple of weeks for hip replacement. Anything else? Mavis? Me and my friend Rick Lowe will be on Thursday at 11 o'clock. Me and my prayer group will be Thursday at what time? 11. 11. Okay. Anything else? Let's invite the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this place. Please come to be with us. Bless your people as we gather and bless this house that belongs to you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now we're going to sing 502, in my heart there rings a melody and it will be taking the offering. <laughs>
beautiful church, a church building, and dedicated people in it. Now we give back to you and help us to use this money and these gifts to the best of your service, Lord. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, take your candle or your bulletin and turn to page 883. We'll sing. There's something about that name, and we'll sing it through twice.
Lord, please lead and guide our prayers by the power of your Spirit. Forgive us. We are prideful, wise in our own eyes, and have forsaken your word for our own desires. Please humble us and help us to submit your ways to your ways. Lord, be in our midst this morning as we come together as your body to lift up our country and our leaders. Protect our country from the division that challenges our ability to live lives pleasing to you. Please unify your people through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the author and protector of our faith, as we cry out to you for our land. Our th thoughts today turn to the people in the South who have been dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. God bless each and every person affected by this storm and surround them with your love. We know there were many lives lost, and our hearts go out to the families of those who died in the storm. Let them know there are many of us out here praying for them and their loved ones. Lord, we know that even in the darkest hours, you are always with us. Turning our prayers closer to home, we pray for our church. We would ask for wisdom in handling the affairs of our church, and we pray for guidance in our decision making. We can't do this without you. Help us to joyfully and sacrificially be the eyes, ears, hands, and feet of Jesus to each other and to our neighbors right here in Sioux Falls. Emmanuel has endured so many losses in recent months. Over just the past few weeks, we've had several more homegoings. We mourn the loss of Roger Best, Frank Baltus, Bob Harris. Let us be thankful for these godly men who impacted so many people throughout their lives. We pray for comfort for their families and friends as they walk through this time of grief. We are reminded in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, that he gives victory over sin and death. We are thankful for this glorious hope. We pray for, pray for Pastor Brett as he takes time to process the death of his father. We pray that this would be a meaningful time for him and his family. We are thankful for Pastor Brett, Carrie, Katie, Austin, Melanie, and James. Please bless them and comfort them during this time of loss. There are several people in our church who have recently endured surgeries and are recovering. We're thankful that Steve, Eva, Pam, and Liz have come through their surgeries. We pray also now for Nancy with her upcoming surgery and pray that you would give her peace and that uh, the surgery would go well and she would heal quickly. Psalm 65.5 tells us that you faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds. We pray now for continued healing and strength. We would also like to lift up those in our church who are struggling with serious illnesses. We pray for comfort and peace as they walk through these difficult times. Help us as a congregation to walk alongside them to offer encouragement, support, and love. Psalms 34.17 tells us to, the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. We call upon you, Lord, to help Carla, Karen, Wayne, Leslie's father, along with so many others, including Bob, uh, Pam's cousin, who recently suffered a mini stroke. Uh, pray for his continued healing. We pray that the doctors that attend to them will have wisdom to diagnose and prescribe the right course of action in each case. We boldly ask for the healing of their bodies, knowing you are sovereign and are able. We are thankful that God never, that love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. 1 Corinthians 13:7. Finally, we remember that your words help us follow the example of Christ. You showed us how to pray. Let us pray the words you taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, how long to have such music?
Steve, do I have to hold this in? No, you do not. Punch it. Oh, there it goes. Gotta love technology. Well, thank you for allowing me to come here and fill this pulpit again. It is such a joy and an honor and a privilege to be here with you, my friends. Of course, it's always, uh, you know, we think of Pastor Brett and his family at this time, and uh, it's not an easy thing. Roger was a, a godly man, and uh, I feel fortunate to know that uh, he and, and Frank uh, were two men I truly respected and honored, and uh, so we all are going to be going through a time of grief and sadness, but we know that one day we all too will meet again, and that's the blessing, the joy, the promise that comes in knowing Jesus as Christ as Lord and Savior. I would like you to take your Bibles, if you have them, I want you to turn to the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. We're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to be in chapter 1. But I, I want to ask you a question this morning. Um, how will, or how do you know someone? Just think about that for a minute. How well do you know someone? Take a look at the people around you. Go ahead. It's okay. We're all brothers and sisters here. Take a look. Go ahead. Look around. It's, it's one time you're going to be given permission to <laughs> look around in church. Because you remember growing up, your mom and dad always says, eyes forward. Keep your eyes on the pastor. That was, you know, my dad was the pastor. I looked at him all day, every day. <laughs> I figured Sunday was the day I could look around. So, how well do you know those people sitting around you? How do you, how do you get to know someone? Well, you're introduced to them, probably. Um, what else? You may know them in a way you might have some common interests. You know, maybe you share a hobby. Uh, maybe you both like to read historical fiction. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because you have some sort of bond or connection. Maybe you went to high school together. Or maybe you're related. And, uh, or maybe you were just best friends growing up. But think about the people in your life. How do you know them? What makes them important to you? We're going to follow that theme this morning as we take a look at Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. I want you to turn to chapter 1 of Colossians. If you don't have a Bible with you, I know there's uh, Bibles in the pews. You can uh, grab those. Um, but we're going to be starting with verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1. And this is what it says. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled 
reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father God, as we enter this time of study, a time of looking into your word, I would pray that your spirit would open our hearts and minds to what you would have us hear today, that we might apply it to our lives, and that we might be able to serve you better. When we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now a little history lesson. Paul never attended or visited the city of Colossae. His only contact with this church was through this letter that he wrote about 60 A.D. The church in Colossae was started by a friend of Paul's, uh, another minister of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that being uh, the missionary known as Epaphras. But Paul had heard about the church of Colossae, and like many of the churches in Asia Minor at that time, the church of Colossae was going through a struggle. There was a new religion that was being birthed at that time. It was an amalgamation of all sorts of different ideas, Greek philosophy, uh, Ju Judaism, Christian beliefs, and some pagan beliefs. That form of religion would later become known as Gnosticism. Basically, Gnosticism in and of itself is saying that Jesus is only one way to get to heaven. And it's okay to continue to live the way you were because, you know, God being God, God's a loving God. God's a, a, a God who, who cares. He just wants you to be in his family. So, you know, if you come to church once a week and do those things, I don't know if that's exactly what Paul was getting at, but you kind of see what I'm getting at. The church in America is facing the same struggle as the church did in 60 AD. Churches in America are being filled with false philosophies and doctrines. Things that are not true. I was greatly saddened this last week when I heard that there were 37 pastors in Sioux Falls who signed off on a letter saying that it was okay for there to be abortion. I was saddened, greatly saddened, that there are so many in God's church, supposedly, who allow so many things to be part of what they believe. False doctrines, not unlike this Gnosticism in ancient times. We live in a world where all of a sudden the world is more important than God. And I know that many of you here today see that each and every day. You see the church falling farther and farther away from the truth in which it was born. So I ask you another question. Who is Jesus? You see, because Paul was all about the gospel message, 
And the gospel message is really very simple. We have all learned it, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So who is Jesus? The people in Colossae were beginning to lose sight of who Jesus was. The very basis of what they were meeting together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's take a look at this, these first few verses. Verses 15 through 20 tell us exactly who Jesus is. First of all, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. When people, even when Jesus was going through his ministry, Jesus would say, I and the Father are one. If you see me, you see the Father. God sent himself down as Jesus so that he could move in and amongst man. To touch, to feel, to hear, to be part of the lives of humanity. He was the firstborn of all creation. If you go back and look at, at John chapter 1, the Apostle John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus was there at the creation of all things. He was the firstborn of all creation. He created all things. He was right there. All things were created by him. Imagine, we always read the, the story in Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth. And he formed everything in it. And his hands formed all the, the animals and everything. But think about this. Jesus, who is God, was there as well. Right there. Everything was made. Created by him. And it was created for him. And because of Jesus, because of God, all things hold together. Think about this. I, I saw a little clip. I wish I, I would have, have written this all down. Um, but I saw a clip the other day where a boy was speaking to his mother. The boy is a very smart person. And he said, the mom did not believe in God at all. And yet her son says, imagine this, mom. If there was 1% less gravity, we could not exist. Or if there was 1%, we would just fly off. If there was 1% more gravity than what we have, we would be crushed. If the sun was a, a certain amount of miles away, we would freeze. But yet if it was a certain amount closer, we would burn alive. Nothing would live. And yet in all of that, in all of that, the Creator gave me the perfect mom. And you think about it. We have a God who holds all things together. We have a Savior who holds all things together. As we read on in these first few verses in, in, in uh, Colossians. He is the head of the body. The church. Christ is the head of the church, not the building, the church as a body. We are all a body of believers. Christ is the beginning, the head, the one who sets the top. 
We are His hands. We are His feet. In this day and age, we are His voice. Our actions are governed by the head, Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn from among the dead. Jesus Christ died on a cross. He died on a cross. He descended. In death, he rose again. And in rising again, he holds the keys to, to death. He holds victory. And it goes on to say, because of that, because he is the firstborn, that he rose from the dead, he has supremacy over everything. That is why in Philippians chapter 2 it says, At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is supreme over all things. You know, the song we just sang uh, by the Gaithers, Bill and Gloria Gaither, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name. For some weird reason, I started singing that song two weeks ago, not knowing that I was going to be preaching here today. Why is that? As I've been studying this book of Colossians, I be, I'm, I'm struggling with who this Jesus is and why he is so important in today's world. And because of where I work, I am granted a wonderful opportunity to share Jesus in a way that a lot of people don't do. I have people who come to me at the credit union and ask me specifically for prayer. They lay their burdens on me. I'm able to share Christ, the gospel. I'm able to invite people to be part of a fellowship. I even invited a bunch of my co-workers to come to church today. You see, because Jesus is supreme over all, we have the wonderful opportunity to share the gospel because anything we do and say in the name of Jesus Christ to further the kingdom will never bring us to shame. We will never be put to shame. People might make fun of us, but it doesn't matter because ultimately we're not here to serve the world. We're here to point people to God through Jesus. The fullness of God dwells in him. Meaning he was fully man, he was fully God. Imagine Jesus walking amongst the people of his day. People looking for God and yet God was standing right beside them. Think about that. My wife spoke at an event this week and she, she asked this question, this very same question that we're dealing with today. Who is Jesus? And many of the people that were at her event, though they had grown up in church, they had no Bible teaching. They didn't know how to find things in the Bible. They didn't have favorite Bible stories. How many of you here have a favorite Bible story? How many of you here have a favorite Bible verse that you go to? A lot of you. You see, we live in a world where all of a sudden, that's not a given. And it's important for us to realize that the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus. That Jesus said, I will be with you. That same fullness can empower us to do God's will while we live. All things are reconciled.
reconciled to God through him. We are all sinners, aren't we? Every one of us, we are born into sin. Because of that first sin of Adam, all of humanity has been tainted. Yet, God saw fit not to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. And it was through Jesus we became reconciled to God. It is through Jesus we are able once again to come before the throne of God with our prayers and petitions, just as was mentioned earlier. We can let our thoughts be known to God because Jesus is there as our reconciler, as our mediator. All because he shed his blood on the cross. A cross not unlike the one up here. His might have been a little bit rougher. His certainly had more splinters. Probably a little heavier. But think about that. You see, we need to pick up God's Word because it is in God's Word. How do you get, the, you know, we go back to that original question. How do you know someone? How do you know someone? You spend time with them. And the only way we can spend time getting to know this Jesus is by reading God's Word. And I'm sure many of you have learned this verse as a child. I will hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Do Christians sin? Oh, oh yeah. Christians commit some doozies. We are not immune to sin. But... We have a risen Savior. We have this Jesus who has gone before us, who has created all things, is in all things, works through all things to bring us to God, His Heavenly Father. God wants to have relationship. And He provided a way for we, the people, to have that. Which brings me to my final question. It's one thing to ask the question, who is Jesus? It is another thing to ask to you, who is Jesus? Think about that, just for a moment. To you, who is Jesus? I can't answer that question for you. I can only answer that question for me. To you, who is Jesus? I can tell you who Jesus is to me. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my friend. And I know that when I die, I will spend eternity in his presence. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. But there are many in our churches today who don't have that faith. They doubt what they believe. They don't understand. 
what Jesus did for them. If I walk out of here today, I'm going to head to my, at my own church this morning. I have to be there for dinner later. But if I was killed in a car accident on my way there, I know exactly where I would be. So the question to you is this. To you, who is Jesus? John 14, 6, Jesus says these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, as we read through this, this letter Paul wrote to the Colossian church, that's the underlying theme. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth. Jesus is the only life. It is only through Jesus who created all things, who is in all things, who works through all things, who is the firstborn among the dead. The one who holds all things together. The one who is supreme over everything. The one who loves you so much that he died for you. It is only through Jesus. Only through Jesus. That you will spend eternity in the presence of God the Father. Only through Jesus. Romans chapter 10 tells us if we can confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. There's something that we have to do. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he, he writes, we must work on our salvation each and every day. Because really, we only have one day, don't we? Now, my dad lived 80 years, just short of 80 years. So if you pulled out a tape measure, and if I pulled out that tape measure to 80 inches, I just had my 67th birthday. If I took a scissors, and I clipped off at 67. How many more years do I have? I don't know if I have that many years from 67 to 80. I don't know if I have one day. I do know I have one day. And in that one day, it is always my hope that the light of Jesus might shine through me. I had a co-worker ask me just the other day, Larry, how come you stay so cool and calm when people are mean to you? I said, well, that's easy. It's because of what Jesus has done for me. And he just looked at me. I've now reached a point where I really don't care what I say at work. Because when it comes to Jesus and my relationship with Jesus, people are going to know. I don't care whether they're atheists, agnostics, if they serve some other religion, I don't care. Because unless they know Jesus, they're lost. So the challenge to you today is this. To answer this question faithfully, truthfully, each and every day. To you, who is Jesus? Because I can't answer it for you. I dare you. Go home. Write out on a piece of paper. To you... Who is Jesus? Tape it somewhere where you can see that every morning when you get up. As a reminder. 
that God loved you so much that He gave you away to spend eternity with Him. We don't have really more than 80 years of life according to the Bible. If you're lucky, you might live longer, the Bible tells us. It's up to us to let that light of Jesus shine in our hearts so that the people around us can know the truth and the way and the life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your son Jesus that you saw fit to send us Jesus to fill him with who you are. And as this sign right to my back says, Emmanuel, God with us. You walked among us. You lived among us. You taught us a way, truth, and a life. Father, may each of us be able to answer that question to you. Who is Jesus? May we be able to say with confidence that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Father, let the light of your love shine in us. May we be your instruments of peace and of truth. May we not waver May we take your word that you give us. May we hide it in our hearts. May we live it and share it each and every day. Use us, Lord. To accomplish your will and your purpose. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Take your hymnals, if you would, and turn to number 585. We'll sing our final hymn today, Be Still and Know. 585, let's stand and sing together.
the sense of purpose, the sense of renewal, knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let your light so shine before men that they might glorify God.